<laughs> okay, so um, you should have your books out by now, unless you are um, balloon deficient. It's okay. I'm balloon deficient, but I prepared earlier. Uh, and the heading is rates of change. Now, while you're finishing up the blowing of those balloons, uh, I just want to show you, I did a bit of measurement to see what was going on. That is not the intended purpose of those balloons. Then it is on an arm. <laughs> okay, now, um, if you'll have a look at with me, everyone would have something slightly different, but here's what I did. Can you see my horizontal axis? Can you actually see I've labeled it? Can you see what my horizontal axis is? What is it? Have a look. It's breaths, right? So I've got, a, I've got a one breath balloon. Yes, I have pathetic asthmatic lungs. I have a two breath balloon, three breaths, and so on. And then what I'm measuring here is the radius of the balloon. Now, in fact, what I've done is I haven't measured the radius. I've actually measured, if you look here, <laughs> good try, Michael. I've actually measured the diameter. And then can you see what I've done? Have a look. I've measured the diameter and I've halved it, okay? So what I'm plotting here, I'll just activate the, the plot for you. There you go. There's my graph of breaths against radius. Now, here's what I love about this, right? What would you expect to be the relationship between breaths and radius? And please forgive me, I know there's issues of like air pressure and all that surface tension and elasticity in here. Let's not worry too much about it. When you, when you inject breaths into the balloon, what are you increasing? You're, well, you're actually, you're increasing a lot of things, but in terms of what you're increasing at a linear rate, you're increasing, I would say, the volume, right? Like you're, you're putting a number of molecules of breath, of air, into the balloon, right? And you can see... Okay, Aaron, you're going to have to calm down. I think you're hyperventilating, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that as volume increases, Radius also increases, but not at the same rate. Do you notice that? Notice that? What do you expect to be the relationship between radius and volume? Think about this. This is roughly, anyway, it's roughly spherical. Yeah? So what's the relationship? If you, if you have a look at the, um, at the screen, if you squint at my equations, there's a bit of a spoiler there. To get from radius to volume, you cube, right? There's a, there's a constant out the front, four-thirds... Uh, pi, right? But essentially, it's a cube. Ow. Well done, good try. Ow. There's a cube relationship there, right? Can you just um just leave it, Aaron? Just leave it. Thank you. Because now we have to all wait for you. Thank you. So, if there's a cubic relationship between radius and volume, I can look at that being that we spent like a good two weeks on this topic. I can look at that as an inverse relationship, right? Can you see the shape here? This is not a cubic curve. This is a cube root curve, isn't it? Can you see how it tapers off? Now, if you actually graph onto here, this is the cube root of x, at least on my scale, okay? You'll notice it doesn't quite line up. That's because of the size of the balloon and the size of your breaths. Everyone will have something slightly different. But if I have a look at mine, you'll see, where am I going to get it to line up? Go away, Qantas. There we go. Uh, it's going to be about... There. There we go. And you can see, as you increase breaths as you increase volume. I know it's slightly off, but that's because I'm using the very scientific unit of Mr. Wu's breaths, and you are too, your own one, so obviously we're not going to get complete consistency, but to be honest, I'm actually I'm quietly impressed with that, that you actually see that relationship that you expect. Does that make sense? Okay, now, if you want, you can draw yourself a rough version of this to illustrate what's going on underneath the heading of rates of change. Let's switch gears now. Let's switch this off. What I want to get across to you is, we've been using calculus as a lens to in understand two basic things, right? We've been understanding gradient, and we've been using the derivative for that, right? Like this. And we've also been thinking about what's the opposite of gradient when we think about this in calculus terms. It's, so when we don't differentiate but integrate, like this, right? You don't get gradient, you get, think about it geometrically, you get 
area. Right, think all the way back to when we first introduced the topic of integration. We said, this is the problem we are trying to solve. Okay? Now, gradient and area, or you could also add volume onto that if you wanted to, because it's a fairly easy uh, extension of that, like so. These are all we've been limited to, limited to because the only derivatives and integrals we've been really working with in a substantial formal way are when you've got x's and y's. In other words, we're on the Cartesian plane. Okay, But the wonderful thing about derivatives and integrals is that we can use them to compare, mark this for a second, just look up, we can use derivatives and integrals to compare the change, that's all the D stands for, right? D for delta, delta is in change. The change between any two things, any two quantities. Now when you compare y and x, you get rise over run. That's why you get gradient, right? But you can compare any things you like. For instance, in this situation here, there's a variety of different things that we could muck about with. A variety of different quantities that change in relation to each other. Does that make sense? 